to the old, the older you get, the longer that takes. So I'm sorry, that's probably taken up now a good proportion of the time I have to speak. But uh, there, there you are. I guess you get a sense from uh, that introduction that what uh, you'll get from me this Saturday morning is uh, kind of a practitioner's perspective on health service reform and health service policy. Uh, and on a Saturday morning, I thought I'd appeal to you more as kind of patients and taxpayers, really, uh, than as kind of highly intellectual specialists in, in any particular field. So this is sort of, you know, the, the, the patient pr practitioner sort of uh, view on health service reform. Because I think there's two quite outward facing aspects of reform that are now becoming evident over uh, years that it's taken some time to produce, but over years now that are really the key from the public's point of view to what's been going on with the National Health Service. And that's the notion of rights and the notion of choice. And to reconcile these two concepts um, is, some people think, impossible. But as a practitioner, I think it's pretty important. And what I'm going to speak about a little bit is uh, you know, how these rather messy concepts are coming into force together. Uh, so, let's see if I can get the gadgetry to work. Um, this little diagram here on, uh, on the uh, slides that you show here is the NHS Constitution. Those of you who are the political scientists in the room know that the British have never really gone in much for constitutions. Uh, they don't have one. They don't see the need for one. And actually, I have to say, as a civil servant, it's a rather you know, freeing environment to work in when you don't require legislation all the time to do every single thing. And when you want to change something, well, you know, you can do it without having to go through a six-year bill process. Uh, I'm sure if uh, our former minister here can speak to the uh, joys that that would mean. So having no constitution, uh, you know, as a practitioner, has had its moments of, uh, of pleasure. But on the other hand, there's a sort of an important codification of rights, which we also hold dear. And after 60 years uh, in uh, existence, which is how long the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, has existed, they have just recently adopted uh, a constitution. That's particularly interesting, I think, when you see that they're doing that uh, alongside really a culmination of five, six, seven years' work on producing choice uh, within, this, within the health service. And I'm going to kind of indulge you, well, I hope you will let me indulge you for a moment by just, it's nothing like seeing is believing. So I thought I would just, uh, I'm going to refrain from showing you the, U the YouTube version, although there are some. Um, just to take you straight to the NHS website, which as you can see is called uh, Choices. You can also, I think, see that it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty different kind of website for a government website. Uh, it's got information in it, but it's very <coughs> customer focused. Uh, I use that language, it's not one uh, that everybody is comfortable with, but it's really the idea that and it was really the organizing principle of reforms that I was involved in constructing, which is the idea that really we should be treating people who use public services as if they're customers. Now, you might think we should be treating them better than their customers, but actually, a lot of people's experience of public services, this is the part of your brain that I want to connect with at this moment, is you know, not really feeling that you have as much choice, freedom, responsiveness uh, as you might do in some of the market. Uh, and you know, that's something we need to address in public service. So the notion of uh, of a, a more patient-focused, customer-focused service is very much in here. So there you have about patient choice. But then, you know, I won't play you video this. I could play this little website where these guys talk about it. Um, it's very popular, so I wanted to be a kind of idea. But here you can see find and compare hospitals. So uh, you go in and you can see find services, choose what's right for you. And there's GPs, emergency urgent care, hospitals, uh, compare hospitals for treatment, dentists, the whole lot. And if I put in my postcode, I'll put where I used to live, so we'll at least know what they're talking about when they come on and I search. And there I have um, the hospitals with an accident emergency clinic near where I used to live in Islington. Uh, and you have there, you know, what they've got, what they've got. Um, I don't know if you put it in wrong, but anyway, there we are. The ones that don't have an A&E, ones that do. Uh, and they'll also tell you how good those hospitals are. 
And they won't just tell you the sort of what we used to call in government uh, the product, or the, you know, the sort of official line of what these hospitals were like. But they'll also tell you uh, what the people say about them. Anyway, we've got the Whittington, which is uh, a very typical general hospital uh, near the postal code where I uh, used to live. You can see it's got an A&E because it says it there. It's just got 26 comments, and these are just random comments that anybody who's used the hospital uh, posted. Uh, so there you are, patient comments. Uh, it's not an official line, I can assure you. They were not uh, edited or cleaned up. Uh, and it says, you know, overall rating, I'd recommend this hospital. Uh, and it says the things that matter, it's very clean. Uh, People work well together, uh, treated with dignity and respect. You know, when you see the sort of number of blue uh, dots. Um, and you see the overall patient ratings at the top. Uh, and, you know, the numbers. So it reads a lot more like, I mean, I just recently booked a sun holiday because I didn't have to go on another few months in the winter without one. And this is not dissimilar, really, from the kind of things you go if you're looking for, you know, a holiday on the main Riviera or something. And I guess that, you know, one could say that's a disgusting commodification of what should be a public good. And believe me, I've heard the argument a lot. I know about it. On the other hand, a lot of people kind of like it. So this is why I said you're going to get the light version um, today, uh, although you could get, uh, you know, a more serious uh, philosophical and you know, legal view on some of the things. But there's also something here called Health Space Choosing Book. So this is, um, so you've got a long interview. There's something here that, okay, well, if you want to know how well the hospital is doing, um, it says compare hospitals for treatment. And here um, you can see the black one says selected treatment or condition. Some of these I don't know what they are, so I'm not going to choose those ones. I'll choose something uh, maybe we all recognize, like allergies. Um, postal code again. And we'll see if you'll get there, a comparison of the different hospitals in this area um, and on a range of criteria down the left hand side, you know, starting with very practical things, how far is the hospital from me, you know, what's the overall quality of the service, how the patients rate their overall care, blah, 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 goes all the way down. And you see on the top the different hospitals, the Royal National Throat, you know, the St. Peter Hospital, the Whittington, okay. and um, you can see exactly, you know, how far they are from the postal code you put in and how they do. And you can see, you know, they're, they're rated. The ENT uh, hospital is rated as excellent, and you, uh, there's something called the Health Care Commission that goes around and rates these hospitals and says whether they're excellent, fair, good, or poor. Um, and, you know, you can see they're not all considered, it's just the, the official line from the Department of Health that they're all fantastic, um, equally good, you know, which is sort of what we expect from universal service. In fact, our universal services are quite variable. So here the patient gets to know about that and gets told us, you know, from fair, more field, through to excellent at the ENT, you know, the good, middle, kind of good, and on a range of things, and what they score. So, I, I don't have time this morning to go through, but if you're interested in playing around with this kind of thing, it is kind of entertaining, uh, and increasingly the data is getting uh, more and more sophisticated, um, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about that. So, if, if you are, let's see if I can get back to where I should be. Um, yes, here we are. So if you're interested in reforming services, it's quite interesting to try and see how you can reconcile that degree of flexibility around personal choice uh, and a constitutional right. And this NHS constitution is, is uh, actually in, in in British land, it's a pretty strong piece of legislation. It will not be able to be changed without a quite high majority within uh, the, House of Con uh, within the House of Commons. Uh, it won't be able to be easily changed uh, from one government to the next without quite a full and public debate, and the terms of that debate are actually specified within the law itself. So I might think this is a sort of legacy piece of legislation for a third term of a Labour government. Um, it would be, I think, quite surprising if they were 